Okay, Mayor, we're ready to go. Very good. Okay, I will uh, call to order the Arvada City Council workshop for December 13th, 2021. Uh, Kristen Rush, if you'll do a roll call. Mayor Williams. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Here. Council Member Pfeiffer. Here. Council Member Marriott. Here. Council Member Mormon. Here. Council Member Simpson. Here. Council Member Smith. Okay, a motion. Yes, Mr. Pfeiffer. I move to excuse Councilmember uh, Smith from tonight's workshop. Very good. Uh, Mr. Jones, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Pfeiffer? Yes. Marriott? Yes. Mormon? Yes. Ms. Simpson? Yes. And the mayor votes yes as well. She is excused on a six to nothing vote. She is actually on her honeymoon out of the country. So good justification. We hope she's having a great time. We have uh, two workshops tonight. Before we start with our workshops, uh, a couple of things I wanted to bring up. I, this is our last meeting of the year, so we won't have another opportunity for council reports. Uh, I did want to note the passing of David Palm, who um, has been very active in our community for a number of years. You either agreed with Mr. Palm or you didn't disagree, or you did disagree with Mr. Palm, um, but uh, he certainly cared about our community, was very vocal in terms of, of his positions, but um, I think it always came from a position of caring deeply about the community. Uh, we are sorry for his passing. He was obviously um, someone who was engaged um, and, and cared deeply, and um, we, uh, we're sorry for his passing. Secondly, um, I have recorded a message um, to the citizens of Arvada sort of a year end, so watch for that. Uh, I won't elaborate on it at this point, but uh, certainly uh, I know for the entire city council, we wish all of our citizens the very best as we come upon the holiday season. And for those who have the Jewish faith who have just completed uh, Hanukkah for this year and uh, wishing everyone a very, very uh, safe and healthy 2022. And let's hope the heck that we can put 2021 in the rear view mirror just as quickly as possible. With that, Mr. Devin, we can move on to our workshops. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we are going to uh, the first workshop uh, is the uh, land development code update and we'll have uh, Director of Community and Economic Development, Ryan Stachelski, introduce this item. Uh, thanks, Mark, and thanks, Mayor and uh, members of city council. Appreciate your uh, time on this uh, important matter tonight. Um, as you recall, we first uh, updated the land development code in May of 2020. Um, there are a lot of significant changes to the land development code um, and, and it was a, a whole rewrite. Um, so now we've lived with the code for um, 16, 18 months. And as you go through, anytime you have an ordinance of that size and that magnitude, you're gonna learn a few things along the way. And so back on September 13th, I believe it was, um, the, the city team brought uh, forth a, a number of, of items that we noticed in the land development code uh, that just need to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, definitions that need to be clarified um, and various aspects. Uh, for the large part of city council, for the most part, city council agreed with all of the um, changes that were being proposed by um, the, the city team at that time. And so we were able to knock um, several of the items off the list. However, there are about four outstanding items that council wanted to have continued conversations on. And so those are the items that we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Rob Smetana to walk us through those items. Um, but I wanna let you know that uh, my, both myself and Emily Grog um, are here from the development review CED team uh, to answer specific questions. And then of course, you know, Mark and, Mark and Rachel are here to answer um, other policy questions as well. But uh, for now, I'll turn it over to uh, Rob Smetana. Rob, you're on mute. 
18 months in. <laughs> there we go. I thought I had hit it and it didn't work. Okay, so here we are. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for the introduction. And uh, as Ryan mentioned, uh, we are here to talk about just a, a handful of topics at this point. Uh, so if you want to jump uh, two slides, please. So uh, the first one, uh, there was some discussion at our September 13th uh, meeting about the notification distance and whether the 500 feet was appropriate or if we should look at increasing the, uh, the radius uh, for notification uh, to a greater distance. Uh, we did do some research uh, around the region and there were uh, a number of communities that went anywhere from 1,500 feet to basically a quarter of a mile with 1,250 feet uh, for notification distances. But the most common uh, distances were somewhere between 500 and 1,000 feet. So we did uh, look at making that modification to 1,000 feet. And I uh, think that's an appropriate balance uh, between the, the various jurisdictions that we've seen. And that would be notifications again for administrative projects, as well as for public hearing cases where a notice is sent out about the public hearings. Uh, for the administrative cases, it would be the notice of administrative decision where that uh, the radius would uh, uh, apply to. Um, so that's kind of what we looked at. Uh, there are some implications to increasing it. Um, just. Uh, uh, as an example, the fence case that you did see last week, the minor modification, we did look at the notification and what that would mean for a small case like that. And um, they had to mail for the 500 foot uh, mailing notice, they mailed to 75 adjacent property owners. With the 1000 foot distance, that would increase in that instance to about 260 properties that would get notification. And that's because there were a lot of smaller lots around that particular case. So that just gives you an example of, of what uh, the difference is for uh, that notification change. But we do feel comfortable with the, the thousand feet. Rob, can I stop you right there and ask a quick question? Yep. So in a a big project that covers a, a lot of ground, you know, a 30 acre site or something is that proposed thousand feet um, from the borders or the boundaries of the development site, or is it a thousand feet from a pin in the center of the site? No, it is from the boundaries of the site. So that would be, you know, if you have 30 acres, it's looking at that entire 30 acres and, and going around uh, the thousand feet from the edges of that 30 acre site. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mormon, did you have a question? I did, thank you, Mayor. Um, my question is about, uh, do we have a system already in place for uh, any resident, regardless of how far they live near a uh, proposal to just get on like a automated email list to, to you know, be notified of any, any uh, rezoning or development proposal changes? We do, um, we do unofficially, you know, we have the three official ways to provide notification, but unofficially we do post on the city's uh, website, uh, the calendar, we send to uh, any neighborhoods that we have emails for that are in the vicinity. Um, we do a number of social media uh, notifications as well. So we do try to go a lot broader than just the mailed notice. I don't see any other questions at this point. Um, are you looking for, you want us to give you a thumbs up, thumbs down on each of these as we do it or just towards the end? That would probably be helpful just so we know if we're going in the right direction or not. Okay. Everybody feel like we're in the right direction? I think oh. this, go ahead. Sorry, Mayor, I'll, I'll, I'll make uh, my, my comments. <laughs> These are tricky because, um, you know, I'd hate for somebody who's, instead of going to the Board of Adjustment, they're ending up at City Council for a major modification for a fence project. 
to have to go and mail out notification to two or three or 400 people just so they can build a bigger fence across their front yard. So I, I, I think that the, the ability for the director to reduce a requirement of limited impact, I think is a key component of this. But I also think on the other hand, if you flip that to the other hand, the biggest projects that we do, um, particularly if they're in certain places, Previously, a 500-foot notification might not notify almost anybody, almost nobody. Um, and a 1,000 feet might, it's certainly better. I think it's on the, wrong, the right track. But uh, for a really large case, a big impactful case, I wonder if, is there, can we also have a, oh, a similar statement that the director can reduce the notice requirement uh, for projects of limited impact but can we also have the community development director have the the uh, the ability to increase it for projects of bigger impact? And I think about, you know, if we think about the Amazon one, uh, nobody in Wyndham Park or Wildflower Ponds would have been notified, even with a thousand foot notification requirement. But it's certainly at least they felt like that impacted them. Um, and, there, and it seems like there should be some way of having some notification in a in a case like that. I think mostly if I look back at like the, the redevelopment of the Kmart site, you know, a thousand foot radius there ought to be perfect. You know, that'd be great. I think in most cases that would be fine, but I always feel really bad if there's residents who feel like things are getting hidden from them or they're not being notified of things when really we've never done that. It's just a perception based on what our rules are for notification. And it seems like they're, if there's flexibility downward, maybe there can be some flexibility upward as well. From the team, what, yes, uh, Mr. Jones. Yeah, no, I actually was gonna uh, make that same comment as Mr. Marriott. So I just wanna put an exclamation point on what Mr. Marriott said, I appreciate that. Anybody else? My only, my only thought, and I'd like to hear what the team has to say. Uh, my only thought is, Frankly, on those more controversial, larger projects, trust me, the word is out. So, you know, <laughs> that I don't know that you need to go to, you know, and I don't know what kind of expense that creates for an applicant. But in reality, for those kinds of larger projects, um, I don't know that it's the mailing uh, that is as important as just um, people observing. And recall that the properties are posted so that that gives some additional notice to people who are passing by. So from the team, oh, Mr. Pfeiffer. Yeah, you know, I was sitting there thinking about what Marriott was saying, but you know, like the Amazon situation, I mean, th think of Wyndham Park, you know, there's a traffic impact with additional trucks on the road, um, but it kind of goes along the lines of what you're saying, Mayor, you know, they, they usually know about it one way or the other. Because also you don't want to create, you know, an engagement of people. Like if we were to notify everyone on the truck route within a block of the truck route, then what what is that? What is that potentially could have an impact? I'm just trying to think of what the right formula is because I don't I don't think it should be so variable, Marriott. The only the only issue I have with it is if you allow that variable to go up and down then that's up to Ryan to decide who he should notify or not and not us. So I think there should be like some more uh, fact-based or a little bit more math put to how they determine it, you know, and I don't know what that could be, but I don't, I don't want Ryan to be put in the position to say, well, he shorted 500 feet and we're all pissed and, and that's not fair to Ryan. Um, sorry, Ryan, I'm using your name the director's position and whoever that may be, you know, I, I want to protect them as well from us. Yeah, we might not all be here and then we're going to get mad because Amazon came up and he was 500 feet short on what we thought was right. So we Don't should really to... keep the subjectiveness out of it, I think. Try to put some more facts around how he notifies it. A, a sliding it... scale, maybe. But don't you have the same issue on the five, the, the, the smaller projects as well? Because there is some subjectiveness to that as well. Well, and I think that, that you could take the type of request, like if it's a board of adjustment request, then should it be a flat, you know, like you said, 500. But if it's a development or redevelopment, then that's, I don't know. 
you know, if it's under an acre or something, then it's only a thousand feet. If it's more than five acres or something, then it's 1500. I don't, there just needs to be like a scale that is used to cross reference that we all agree to. And maybe, maybe the team can go back and figure out what would be appropriate to, to handle a few of these that pop in because you look at the master plan for, let's just say for Lime Rock or for Candelas, one of these big ones, not that there would be another one, but back then a thousand feet would have been nothing. No. No, nobody would show up. What, ten people would have got an email, or a, you know, yes. for both developments. So I, I mean, I agree with it, but look at the acreage of it. You know, that one might be a mile radius. Um, uh, to know. But I just, I would encourage that we maybe not be so subjective on the director on, on allowing it, and, or give him some criteria in which he can work under or she. Just my thought. Don't have to listen to it. Yeah, we have to listen to it. Whether or not we have to agree with it is another question entirely. True, um, fair enough. Okay. Ryan, do you have anything on this from your perspective? You know, I, I appreciate the conversation. I, 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 I agree with um, Council Member Pfeiffer in the sense that if we were going to go larger, um, having some criteria like five acres or, or whatever um, makes make some sense because once you start getting into the discretionary aspect of it, I do see situations of saying, well, it was, you know, I, I was a thousand one feet away and I didn't get noticed and, and, and that did me harm in, in some way. So having that kind of black and white is, is something that gives me a little bit more um, uh, comfort um, in that I'm not being arbitrary and capricious, which I could be accused of, of unintentionally um, based on my initial perception of whether or not something was controversial or not. I'm less concerned about it um, in terms of uh, uh, the downsizing of things, just because um, those things are usually fairly um, obvious and, and, and good examples uh, of something that's a, a, a lot more minor. Um, we always have the, well, we're gonna do a thousand feet to, to fall back on and and I don't have to use the discretion to go down. It's a little bit more of should you use discretion to go up and people kind of accusing you of not going up. Um, it's, it's not as bad to stay up and, and then go down in, in cases that are clearly minor cases. So I like the idea of using some level of criteria and, and we don't have to decide that tonight. We, our team can go back and, and uh, come up with some formula um, that, that articulates that. But I also say that I also agree with the mayor that when something's controversial, people know about it. And, and we do a good job of getting the word out there. This is the formal notice, uh, but we do a lot informally to make sure that people are aware. Ryan, can I make just a suggestion and, and maybe something your team can look at? I think that's probably the right way to do it is have the professionals look at it. But I would... <clears throat> I think a sliding scale would be great. If, in my eyes, if it was 20 acres or bigger, I would expect bigger notification than if it was under 20 acres. And certainly if it impacted less than two acres, I would expect smaller. Um, and so, you know, for, for me, if I were thinking of it, I'd be thinking of anything that, that involves a, a single development of 20 acres or more. The, the notification radius might ought to be 1,500 feet instead of 1,000 feet. And then if it's because that would only I don't know how many bigger than 20 acre sites we have. Not a lot, obviously. So that wouldn't be used a lot. But anything bigger than 20 acres is pretty impactful and people ought to really know about it. Um, and uh, so that that'd be my suggestion just as as a throw out there. Thank you. OK, I don't see anybody else wanting to chime in. So you're going to go back, give some more thought to criteria so that we so we don't have any unwritten rules and so that we're not putting the uh, director in a position of being accused of picking picking winners and losers very good okay Sounds Rob, good. you want to go on we'll go take a look at that uh the next two there were uh, kind of two topics here on this next slide that uh, did, was easier just to put them kind of together and that is uh, the whole discussion about fleet vehicles. And that did come up during the, the Amazon uh, situation where they had a huge parking lot that was designed for their vans. 
And so we did want to go back and take a look at uh, creating a definition for a fleet vehicle and then limiting uh, the fleet vehicle parking areas. So you can see here the definition, which is basically a, a motor vehicle, a car, van, truck, uh, that's owned or leased by a business or an agency uh, rather than an individual or a family. And we gave some examples of the types of vehicles that would be considered uh, fleet vehicles, just so to add some additional clarification to that definition. And then we looked at the limitations so that there would be a limit on fleet size depending on the zoning district in which the, the site was located. Uh, we also did set kind of a ground floor to kind of capture those smaller mom and pop plumbing companies or uh, electrical companies and said that the, the, the floor, or I guess, yeah, sort of the floor would be the 25 vehicles. Anything less than that would be exempt from these regulations. Uh, in terms of the area of a parking area that a fleet could, could occupy. Uh, and then we went up from there and said that you calculate your minimum parking requirement, not the minimum that is proposed, but the minimum parking that's allowed by code. And in the, the commercial general district, you could have 50% of, your, of those parking spaces occupied by fleet vehicles. Uh, at, in the IL zone, the, the light in the uh, industry zone, uh, that would go up to 100%. And then in the IG, our heaviest zone, that would be, you could have up to 200% of your minimum parking uh, being occupied by fleet vehicles. So quick question on that. <clears throat> so you're saying, I'm just, I don't know what the, the parking ratios are for each one of those zones off the top of my head. But if if the first one, 50%, um, so if the parking uh, ratio was 100 spaces, um, then they could park 50 fleet vehicles in those 100 spaces? Correct. So the maximum number of fleet vehicles you could have would be 50, uh, or 50 parking spaces dedicated to fleet vehicles. Beyond that, you, you'd meet your minimum parking requirement and you could go above your minimum parking requirement, but you could not, you could not uh, say, so you, you could uh, have a situation where uh, they're required to have a minimum of 100 parking spaces and they do 125. Well, you don't get that extra 12 parking spaces for the fleet vehicles. You're, you're capped at 50% of the minimum. So even if you had 125 spaces for customers, you could still only have 50 spaces for fleet vehicles. Okay, thank you. Simpson? Uh, thank you, um, and thank you, Rob, for the presentation this evening. Quick question on the definition of a fleet vehicle. I see, you know, um, owned or leased by the company, but what about contractors? Um, this is something we're starting to see more and more of is that people who are contract delivery drivers using their own vehicle, is that going, it's being used as a fleet vehicle, but is it being defined as one? Is it, is it being encompassed in that 50? Rob, I can help answer this question. Sure, go ahead, Ryan. Um, so the answer is no. Um, it, because it's not being parked on site, it's not being maintained on site, it's not being um, held there overnight until an employee comes and replaces it with their private vehicle in order to go in and um, park it there overnight. If you think about other scenarios in which you could have a slippery slope of getting into private vehicles that are being used for delivery, for example, as fleet vehicles, you know, Domino's Pizza would now have fleets for their um, employees that are coming in and, and delivering pizzas. Um, the DoorDashes and the Uber Eats and those types of things. Because those fleets are not being housed on site and they're not providing parking on site for those vehicles, they're just being there to pick something up and then leave. It is not part of the definition of fleet. Okay, perfect. And I understand why that is for parking, although, and I realize it's coming later in the presentation, where we get to with, in terms of total trips, that does concern me a little bit, um, depending on how many uh, fleets come, uh, vehicles come through there, but we can talk about that later. Thank you, Ryan. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I, I wanted to follow up with that question as well. Why are semi trucks not included as part of the fleet? The way uh, you know semi trucks are, are very similar to a private auto vehicle. They could be part of the operation, but they can also be independent uh, trucking companies that are just bringing product to a site. So it's it's hard to consider them um, fleets in that type of situation. And generally though, we don't see a ton of parking associated with semi trucks. Well, where we have seen these instances, it's where you get the smaller vehicles that that's where they're accounting for, uh, kind of the fleet vehicles. Uh, with semi trucks, they're usually just kind of there and then gone. They don't usually park overnight or if they do, it's there for the overnight and then they leave in the morning. Um, so it's a slightly different uh, way to look at how the vehicles actually operate coming in and out of the site. So I guess I'm not clear then on really the definition of a fleet then, because it seems to me if, especially if, if it sounds like if it's parked overnight, then it's classified as a fleet. But if, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on that, but if, but if that's the case, then there are going to be instances where there is going to be a semi truck parked overnight, it seems like to me then if that's the standard, it should be counted as part of the fleet. Typically though, they're, they're just there to unload their product and then go on where a fleet would actually potentially be maintained on the site as well as parked on the site. Um, and you generally, with a truck coming in and out, not having also a private vehicle there where somebody's getting into their private vehicle and going, it's usually happening while the driver is, is uh, in the vicinity of the truck and then leaves after it's loaded or unloaded. Um, so that's why we did make the di distinction between the two. We can certainly go back though and look at other options for uh, fleet vehicles as well. But the idea was really to talk about those smaller vehicles, which are the ones that really tend to take up a large portion of the site as we, we've seen with these types of warehouse operations. Jones? Just a follow up on Mr. Mormon's comment there. The way I guess I was looking at that or when I read it, typically a tractor trailer backs into a dock area and for the purposes of loading and unloading. And then to your point, uh, they maybe they're overnight and then pull away. So how, how are we thinking about kind of the open lot storage of a tractor trailer that maybe not hooked the tractor's gone, but the trailer's sitting there overnight. How, how are we thinking about that? And is there, to Mr. Mormon's comment, is there any, um, does that 50%, does that calculation count towards those trailers that may be sitting overnight as well? Uh, the way it's written, it does not. It would just apply to the actual, essentially the, the motorized vehicle, not the, the trailer. And I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Jones. I was just going to ask a follow up to that. That uh, so, um, so if, if a potential user using the scenario of 100 spaces could use 50 of those for fleet vehicles, and uh, 25 of those fleet vehicles were simply trailers, and 25% or 25% of the 25 of those vehicles were a fleet, a motorized vehicle. Are we okay with that based on this? Do we want these areas for trailer storage as well? So yeah, I'm just, I'm not asking for the answer now. I'm just asking kind of as a, as a question to be thoughtful around as we're thinking about this definition. So I, I think that the, the, I think the, the distinction here is once it doesn't have a, uh, um, a motor on it anymore. Um, it becomes in the definition of outside storage. And so then I think that it becomes a different category. It's no longer a fleet vehicle. They're storing, because you could have connexes or tractor trailers and those types of things. And I've certainly been part of conversations in which people have 
um, uh, tractor trailers that are parked outside there and they just have them full of stuff. And you're not allowed to, to whether it's a Connex or a tractor trailer, um, just store things and have that outside storage. So you're, you're getting into a different category and a different definition of what that is um, once you start just storing trailers there. Trailers need to be in the active use of unloading or loading uh, in, a, in a bay or maybe in a parking space waiting for a bay to be ready, but they're usually in an active part, not a passive part of it, unless it's specifically designed for something like that. And that would get more into the bucket of a heavy logistics center rather than a, an IL where you'd see more um, fleet vehicles. So that would be captured in a different way in the zoning. Thank you. Pfeiffer. Uh, well, I think he answered the question. I think for me is I'm trying to picture, you know, a uh, light industrial area that might have tractor trailers all hooked up, picking up that parking with the, you know, the full motor hooked into the, into the, uh, the trailer part. You know, um, I'm thinking of like, you know, when you go over there by what is it, Federal or Pecos or somewhere over there where they have a whole bunch of them just lined up. Um, is that an acceptable use in an industrial light? Because, and I don't like, I, I think, like, just like Mr. Jones said, I'm a little worried. Not that we need an answer here, but we just need to be thoughtful that it can, can it be, is, is the request you're asking or the refinement of this open up other uses that we're just not, not seeing? Uh, my, my fear is, is, yeah, they, they put the 100 parking spots and then there's 25 rigs. That are lined up, you know, in those parking spots, hooked up, ready to go, and then now we've turned a light industrial into a heavy distribution that are idling. Not, and I say idling, not as in the engine, but you know, there's there's vehicles, big vehicles, ready to move. Is there some language that says, or should we think of language that says something to the effect of like what King Supers does? Uh, the tractor trailer pulls up, drops off the trailer, the tractor part leaves, go gets another truck. It's okay that that's hooked up in the bay, or it's in the bay. It's fine. It's being serviced, but when it starts sitting out in the parking lot, that's when the, like you said, storage becomes an issue. Is the tractor hooked to the trailer, sitting in the parking lot? Is that an issue? Uh, can that count as fleet? And and I think I almost feel like you kind of should call those fleet because they have logos on the side. They may not be that property owner's fleet, but it's somebody's fleet showing up and staying there. And so we just need to maybe put some thoughts around that. I don't know what the right answer is, but maybe you can craft something that prohibits long, uh, uh, you know, parking of, of tractor trailers and multiple tractor trailers that are hooked up. I don't mind the bay part, you know, when they're hooked into the bay because they're being they're being worked on usually if they're in a bay, right? They're being unloaded, loaded. That could take days. It's when the when the tractor part's hooked up, I think is the distinguishing factor for me. Barman. And, and uh, a question about how the uh, percentages for the limitations, the percentages of the parking are calculated, that, that's based also off of the, the square feet footage of the building itself, correct? Yes, it's based somewhat off the square footage and somewhat off the use. It's, it, it's, uh, there's a couple of different ways that we calculate parking, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's generally based off the square footage of the use that's occupying that space. So I think what would be helpful for me and then the public to understand the implications of this too is maybe just have a, a chart that puts it you know, in those terms of if you have a 100,000 square foot building, this is how many parking spots, and then this is the percentage of those parking spots because I, I think it's a little hard to make that connection without knowing, connecting all those dots. Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, yeah, we can definitely do that. And then it also, it would depend again on what zone district it's in as well. So the graduating scale of the, the zone district as well. I think what we've got here is a little bit of a cross issue with regard to the semi-trailers and fleet vehicles. The, the one that comes to mind for me, and I see it all the time, is at the, um, the Walgreens at at uh, 64th and McIntyre. I mean, there's a trailer out there. And I almost think they've got it out there for advertising purposes. 
And we all know that Jake Jabs does that with American Furniture uh, at his locations where, you know, he's come up against the sign code and says, well, I'm going to park my big uh, trailer out there on, on uh, Wadsworth and what is it, 92nd or so as just as an advertising. So, Ryan, I know that's a totally separate issue, but are, do we have ways to address that? Um, do we have ways of address? Yes. Um, so, you know, the, they're not a lot like for Walgreens, for example, um, you know, they can't have a tractor trailer out there in perpetuity. I can't remember what the code exactly says, but I think that there's a certain number of hours in which it needs to be moved um, or, or shown to be moved um, that that addresses that kind of um, situation. Um, like the Walgreens situation or the Jake Jab situation. Yeah, we do have that. It, it, it's addressed in our sign code that basically okay. talks about signage on uh, motorized vehicles. Well, I haven't filed any complaints, and I don't know if anybody else has, but uh, it's it sits there. I almost thought it was put there to sort of block people from seeing the sprouts. <laughs> but that's just my devious mind at work. Okay. Do you feel like you've got enough direction on this one to go back and do some more noodling? I think so. Great. Okay, Rob, you want to move on to the next one? All right. Yep. So the next one, uh, again, somewhat interrelated here. Uh, and it has to do with uh, review of projects through the conditional use approval. So that's when the planning commission weighs in with a recommendation and council either uh, approves or denies a conditional use. And there was some question the last time uh, we met about um, how, how we then tie what you saw at the conditional use level to an actual site plan that comes with the next step of the process. And that would be an administrative review versus the conditional use being a public hearing review. And what kind of changes are being made or could be made between those two steps. If there's just kind of a carte blanche Yes, we give a, a conditional use approval for a particular type of use. Particularly, I think it was focused on residential projects. And if you approve a, if you just say you're approving a conditional use for residential on a particular property, um, how does that then tie to what you saw in terms of, of a conceptual plan at the conditional use level as we move into the site plan level? So we wanted to tighten that up a little bit. And so we're proposing to add language that says uh, that if an application uh, includes the residential use and it was granted a conditional use approval, then the number of residential units proposed must be within 10% of the number of units that was presented during the conditional use review. So that gives a little bit of flexibility uh, to a project. So if they're you know, looking at the building and they decide they want to go with more studio units than two bedroom units, that gives them the flexibility on the units to kind of move things around, but that won't really change the footprint of a building. So we, we're hoping that that number kind of works to create a, a stable footprint, but allows some flexibility of what actually happens with, the, with uh, inside of those buildings. And then we're also proposing to, not as part of the code, but just as a, a condition of conditional use approval within the MX zoning districts, saying that the site plan uh, application shall be substantially similar to the conceptual plan as part of the conditional use of, uh, review. So again, that ties down a little bit of the site design but still allows the flexibility in the number of units within a particular building. We would also then you know, still be reviewing it for parking requirements, uh, all the other requirements that would be associated with that as that number moves up and down that small increment, but it still allows a pretty good idea of what a project's gonna look like moving forward from that conditional use approval. Viper, you're first. So, I don't know, I kind of struggle with any flexibility like that because if you're in front of council and you're selling me a bag of goods, I should probably assume. Now you said, ideally the site shouldn't really change as much, but I think I worry about what, what happens of 10%. Good example, talking just to Ryan tonight, could be you know 750 units in a parcel. 
you're talking about 75 additional units that may impact other things um, that is administratively done. And me as a council member don't recall that we allowed an additional 75 units to go into this area because we approved a number, a vision, a plan that now all of a sudden has flexibility beyond what we approved. I could understand going below. I don't, I can't understand going up. So if we approve a threshold, just like you're saying number of notifications, if we assume a, a number of 750 units, then I expect you not to go over that 750 units. I also expect that when you come and present me a plan, it better be well vetted to come and see us in front of city council because I, that's what drives me crazy is things change and we didn't know it changed and then it creates more phone calls. And you might think it's minor, but it might not have been minor for the people we represent. So I. I, I don't necessarily support the increase of 10%. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure I understand the difference of your second question of the site plan versus the concept conceptual. I, I get that some maybe might change there, but maybe you can explain a little bit more of what would change that you feel is substantial or, or, or I don't know what the word you used, but that's not substantial that is done administratively and not through council. Yeah, I think it would mean, you know, if they if they proposed uh, two buildings, let's say in a mixed use zone district, one is residential, one is um, commercial, and said, you know, we're going to have uh, 500 residential units and a X number of square feet of commercial as part of this project. But then if they came up with a site plan that said, you know, maybe we're only going to do a, a thousand feet of commercial and we think we should, uh, you know, have 600 or 700 residential units. Obviously, we're going to look at that and say that is not what was approved. And so that any change of that magnitude would have to go back to council to review um, again as part of the, uh, another conditional use approval. But if they tweak it and say, you know, we're going to have 10,000 square feet of commercial space, but when it comes down to really designing it, they end up with 9,500 square feet and the residential, you know, maybe goes up or down a few units, that we would look at as saying that's an insubstantial change and we would move forward with that particular project. But that could be an apartment complex. Like let's look at the Kmart property. 10% could completely change exactly the small threshold in which we all agreed and approved in the options that were provided, right? Because there were two options that could have happened. I think it's something like that. How, I'm not comfortable with you having that subjectiveness with those situations. And that particular one, because I think we were on the cusp of it. You know, some people thought there should have been more commercial. Some people thought there should have been maybe less residential or more residential. But how would you see that one playing out? I would say there we would definitely look in and see what the discussion was around a particular project. And you know, if we feel that, hey, there was a whole discussion about we need this much commercial space, and that's a key component of what was approved, and they were to come in with something less than that, we would definitely flag that and bring it back to you in some form, either informally to say, hey, here's what we've got, uh, the, and are you concerned enough about it that we need to bring it back to you? Or we may just say right out, this is just not what council intended with the approval. And we think it needs to go back through a conditional use review. Listen to what others have to say. Norman, you're next. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just I want to echo the concerns raised by uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, and just to add to that, you know, in that example that that he shared about 75 more units, for example, in an apartment or complex like that. Um, how would the parking then be accounted for? Because I, I would assume that the parking has already been planned out and now they're increasing the number of units in the in the building. Um, I, I don't wanna end up with a situation where we've got overflow parking on neighborhood streets because the parking wasn't accounted for in the, in the building as originally planned. Yeah, if, if we're gonna look at at the site plan level, the number of units that are proposed. So if they increase the number of units, then they would have to increase the amount of parking uh, commiserate with that number of units. So um, 
then we would we would be able to review that and say yes or no it doesn't comply with the the overall original approval in, in terms of the concept plan what we have been seeing though doesn't really affect the footprint of the building what we've seen is people coming in and saying you know we had planned for this to have um, you know 25 uh, two bedroom units and now we want to do 30 studio units that actually, if that was the instance, that would actually reduce the amount of parking that's required, even though the number of units is going up because the parking required for two bedroom units is greater than the parking that's required for studio units. So a lot of those things would happen really without anybody seeing the difference um, on a site. However, if it did become, you know, hey, we had 30 studios and we want to you know, convert those to 32 bedrooms, then there is a parking situation that we'd have to review. It would have to meet the code. And then when we would look at the site plan uh, that would result from that, we would then say, does this substantially comply with what, do, were they able to make it work and substantially comply with the council's approval? Or is this a change that's significant enough to come back to council? Well, Mr. Marmon, thank you for channeling Mr. Marriott when it comes to concerns about overflow parking. Mr. Marriott, you're next. <clears throat> thank you. I just have a quick question for Rachel Morris. And the question is, is there a legal definition to substantially similar? And do we know what that definition might be? There's, in, there's definitions we could pull from in a number of different contexts. It just depends on, since this the interpretation that we're looking at here is an interpretation of our own code. We can craft a definition that you're comfortable with, um, but I'm sure we have definitions under the code right now um, that they are referring to when determining whether or not something is, and I think Ryan can correct me, Ryan and Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, but the terminology that they use at the um, team level is minor, whether it's a minor modification or a major modification. So whether it's a substantial departure from what was originally um, the decision of council originally made. But again, this, since this is our code, we could go through and, and pull definitions from there as to um, what was substantially similar. Is, is that something that would be defined within our code, the phrase substantially similar, since it's you know, it's used here as a as a decision point. You know, is this substantially similar? I would think as a developer, I would be saying, "What does that What does that mean?" You know, is that just? I mean, I mean, it's I know it when I see it. Or, you know, one person substantially similar might be one person's giant change. You know, I, 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 would we actually try to define it then within our code so that everybody knew what it was, or how would we how would we do that? So I think Ryan's unmuted. So I think he's got some um, input on this one. So I'll hand it off to him to see if if he has some uh, some input on this one. So um, it is not codified uh, the term substantially similar. However, I will tell you that it appears other places in the code. So it's particularly when we're looking at the implementation of things like PUDs or PDPs and those types of things. <laughs> Excuse me and you get certain levels of elevations for um, homes and you get five different character styles or whatever. Um, and we're not necessarily saying that um, you have to build exactly what the elevation is, but it needs to be substantially similar. So to, to kind of take an extreme example, if somebody came in and got a PDP approved and it was all traditional housing with front loaded garages and pitched roofs and front porches and those types of things, then you have a general idea of what that's gonna look like. And then they come in for FDP and they have flat roofs with rooftop garages, rear alley loaded um, garages and those types of things. That is something that is you know, clear to us um, that is not substantially similar. Now that's an extreme example because you can tell the difference between that. But we certainly get into a lot more nuanced conversations when PDPs come in and they start bringing in our elevations. Um, I could tell you that our planners take great pride in wanting good products 
uh, to be built. And so when we see things that don't have four-sided architecture, when they limit this, the architecture on certain sides because it's facing an alley or, or whatever, but that's not what they sold us as a bill of goods, then we will push back on them and we will use that term substantially similar as a way of kind of pushing back because we're always going to try to get the best possible product. And that's where we pulled that term from in the same sense is because we're comfortable and used to using it. So in, in a sense, like uh, this case, if you had a, 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 Rob's right, like we would really look at the footprint of the building. And if you're changing what's going on in the building, like where the elevator shaft is and that change units up or down or whatever, we're not gonna get too concerned about that if the elevation and the exterior of the building is the same. But if you came in and you said, you're gonna have a hundred units, but it's four buildings of 25 each, and that has a certain architectural look and feel and open space and ratios and all that other stuff. And they say, no, we want the economies of scale. We're now gonna put those hundred units into one building. That's not substantially similar. Um, and so those are the types of big changes um, that we would look at. If the, if the footprint stays the same, if the architecture stays the same, that's what substantially similar is. If they start making more buildings or less buildings, um, if they create more open space or less open space, those types of things, that's when we're gonna start getting into the pushback of, listen, this is not similar to, to what you um, um, went to council with. And if I can just add a little bit on to what Ryan mentioned, this is very similar to the way we treat PUDs today and have treated PUDs in the past. And I would hope, bring my fingers crossed, that you think staff has done a good, I, good job going between the preliminary development plans and the final development plans as we've moved those PUDs forward. And we have, again, very similar language. I think in the FDP, it says uh, it has to match the uh, PDP, except to uh, any variations the director determines are insignificant. And that's the language that's been in that section of the code for many, many years. Uh, so we would treat this exactly the same. And um, as I'm sure you were aware, as we did have a lot more PUDs in the past, we would bring PDP amendments to council when things were modified or changed or we didn't feel comfortable were, were similar or that were significant. So um, we would treat this uh, the same way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Simpson. Thank you. Um, I actually want to echo uh, some of my colleagues' concerns, particularly about the uh, number of units going up. Um, because as Mr. No Mormon noted, you know, that could impact parking and that would be accounted for. But where my concern comes in is in the traffic study. We have car traffic volume counts uh, accounted for with all of these projects and whatnot. And I, I'm guessing that if we were to increase the number of units, um, say not necessarily going from a um, two bedroom down to a studio, but what if the two bedroom is just made smaller by square footage and they pack more two bedrooms in there? Um, they can do that. Bedrooms could be made quite small these days. And so that's my primary concern is um, we have certain parts of town where we do have a lot of large multifamily unit complexes, mainly um, South Arvada on the Wadsworth corridor, as well as uh, in Mr. Marriott's district on the Kipling corner. It's likely we'll have more of these I-70 uh, corridor uh, developments coming along. And what happens when, you know, we have five, six, or potentially seven large multifamily unit um, developments, and we've accounted for a certain amount of traffic, but if each one goes over by nine, 10% and puts more units in there, suddenly we're getting to a substantial increase in units that we didn't necessarily account for in our early data collection. So just, just my own hesitation about adding the ability to go up. I, I, I understand that we don't want to make a developer do significant uh, revisions and interrupt the process of a development for small changes. I certainly, um, like even two to three percent, I'd probably be a lot more comfortable with, but 10 percent could be fairly significant when we start looking at these large multifamily complexes. Mr. Jones. Thank you. So, um, 
not to beat a dead horse here, but uh, what it boils down to, at least in the conversation for me, is it's about trust. Um, and do we trust our professional staff to make um, a judgment call with regard to substantially different? And when that judgment call is made, um, will they be able to um, then communicate back to the developer that either A, those were accepted or B, they need to return to the beginning of the process. Um, and at, at what point then does that become uncomfortable for our team to, to have that conversation and say, look, you've been through this process, it's been approved in this format, but based on what you're saying now, you've got to go back now through the entire process and start over. I mean, is that, is that what I'm hearing? Or, or somewhat part of the process, but we do like to use that as a as a hammer, so to speak, to make sure that we do get plans that comply with what council's desire was. Um, so we 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 frankly would use that fairly often. I would think if people were pushing the boundaries of what we thought were insignificant changes, uh, we would definitely use that and say, "Hey, you either." bring it into compliance or you're gonna be back at council and having to go through a public hearing process again with the whole, uh, with all the input from the public and council and planning commission. Um, that is definitely a good, a good tool to have in our, our tool belt. Sure. So then, so with that, <clears throat> let's pretend using one of the examples of studios to two bedrooms or whatever. And let's just say it did change. Um, and I know, and I apologize, if council member Simpson already asked this question. So if she did, you can just say, go back and listen to the tape, David. But um, the, if, if, if in fact that were the case, and again, this is all hypothetical, um, would we require the developer then to go do another traffic study um, outside of the one that they'd already submitted based on those kinds of changes? We certainly could. The code does give us that discretion if we think it's, it's necessary. Okay. Have we ever asked? Have we ever asked up to this point for a revision of studies, whatever it may be, whether it be traffic or environmental? Okay. Yes, um, we have definitely in the past with PUDs, especially when there was a time lapse between you know kind of our initial approval and final approval. We definitely have required that because we understand conditions. Yeah, conditions change on a site, and they also change in the vicinity, as, as Council Member Simpson mentioned. And so we're cognizant of that and, and we have done that and, and, and would look to do that in the future if it was necessary. Okay, thank you. Pfeiffer. So, um, uh, you know, when I was thinking about the more traffic comments, you got to think about, you know, we did in, in, in our, you know, land development codes and so forth, we've created a lot more density, especially in the uh, Wadsworth corridor. You know, where, what, what they, I forgot the numbers, R85 and can't remember, but they're pretty, pretty hefty units per acre. Um, so, you know, 10% variance, I think does impact traffic, especially in dense areas. And I get a little worried about that. Um, so I just want to highlight that Yes, you you know this conversation maybe is not as important today, but tomorrow with the current land development and redevelopment, it will be a huge impact in the neighborhoods. Um, so just keep aware of that. Uh, probably one of the biggest reasons why I wouldn't support anything more than ten percent of what or anything north of of what we approved during a hearing. Um, substantially similar for years. That I think you said that, Rob. You know, I think that terminology might have worked in the old LDC, but the new LDC is a lot different. And there seems to be more, you know, administrative approvals and reviews and flexibility. Uh, and, and I think that's where I have hesitation with that, that terminology. And I appreciate Mr. Marriott asking for the definition. But to me, it's still subjective and it's still loose. And it's not that I don't trust you, Rob, or Ryan, or any of the team. It's the fact that we're elected to represent our communities and we have to be uh, thoughtful stewards of, of that and make sure that we have a voice at the table um, as well. So, you know, think about sustainability beyond us. All of us on this call right now, when we're all gone and this is a memorialized, institutionalized 
type of document. Now what? How are these defined? You know, how are these, how are you stewarding or shepherding these uh, substantially similar for years on, on a new LDC that is, I think we still have hesitation on. I mean, I'm, I'm, we've had a lot of conversation around L, the new LDC than, than we've had probably prior. Um, you know, the, wor the worry I have with some of the substantial uh, similar kind of statements is, and, and talking about going back through, it kind of bothers me a little bit because the, the developer has now an opportunity to say, well, you have allowances. I told the council this, but hey, you got some flexibility. And I know what you're saying, but what, uh, again, assuming none of us are around, substantial similar could be a, the, a, you know, a decision of the eye of the beholder. And, and they're making a decision that you allow there's allowance to be you know given for change and and yes we're all saying it here but i i again think there should be objectiveness around it it should be as close to what we've approved never north of what we approved and we need to be very clear about that and that's when i think we get ourselves in trouble is if 10 percent in high density areas or big sprawl areas is substantial in my eyes now, in, in a small 300, is 30 units big? Possibly, especially if they're going from one to two or studios to one bedrooms. So I, I, I think that there's still some more work here. I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I, I would appreciate a little bit more work on these two bullets. Uh, that would make me feel a little bit more comfortable. I don't see other hands. A couple of comments for me. First of all, could we have as a condition for approval on individual projects that there will be no increase in number of units. So that yes, would help address, that. We, that could help address, you know, making a statement as a council when these projects come before us that, you know, Mr. Developer, Mrs. Developer, don't even try to, to uh, seek any additional numbers because we've determined that you've hit the max and we're not gonna consider any additional period. Um, and then I would like to see if we could develop a definition. Uh, Ms. Morris will appreciate this. It's sort of like the definition of pornography. We, I, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Uh, so you've got your work cut out for you to try to come up with an appropriate definition, but I think you can probably do so particularly because we got in other places where we use it, we ought to define it so that we, we make it as objective as possible. The, the other thing I want to mention just for your consideration is we're, staff is fine with narrowing the parameters of the 10%. So, and even like if you wanted to put, you know, 0% north and 5% south or split it up. So th this is, this is a, our, our recommendation. This is us looking at it. We started with what is appropriate for a minor modification and, and reined it in from there. So a minor modification, you can deviate from a development standard of up to 20%. We felt 20% was too large. So that's why we kind of brought it in a little bit. But if you guys wanna bring it in more, you're, we're, we're certainly open to that and have no issue. This is something we want you to feel comfortable with. So we can define substantially similar. That's I don't, I'm not going to say easy, but it's some Rachel's doing, so it's easier for me. Um, and uh, I'm just kidding, Rachel. And and we can bring in those numbers uh, to something that uh, council feels more comfortable with, and, and we're okay with that too. Ms. Simpson, trying to get off mute there. Thank you. Yes, uh, I would probably be comfortable with that approach of narrowing. And one other thought I, I had here that occurred to me while Ryan was discussing going back to. Um, Rob's initial point about, you know, two bedroom units to studios or potentially studios to two bedroom units. I have some concern as well about dramatically changing the type of housing that could be within a unit. For instance, if we're pitched two bedroom units, that, that tends to attract a certain kind of like young couple or young family, et cetera. Studios often attract a, um, like a, a younger single individual, et cetera. 
So I, I also have some pause about um, not looking at the type of housing contained within, because we still want to make sure everything fits within the existing community for which it's pitched to. And obviously that can also affect prices. So we might look at studios to be able to create more workforce housing, but two bedroom units go for a lot more. And so then it changes what may be substantially similar to the council's vision. So just something to consider as well as we go to look at those parameters in trying to keep the mix inside and not just the square uh, footage the same. That, that sounds great. I, I also did want to point out if I can that you do have a lot of discretion when you do a conditional use approval as well. So if there if there's a particular project that you, if there's a certain feature of that project that you think is extremely important, you can make sure that is a condition of approval as well. You do have that type of discretion in the code. Excellent. No, I, think we, I think we may want to spell that out. I'm, I'm hearing Mr. Pfeiffer and agreeing that, you know, some of us are getting long in tooth here looking at myself and, you know, we're, we're not going to have that institutional memory on some of this. So to the extent that we can spell out that council has the discretion as for, you know, on conditions for approval to um, compel the applicant to um, not have any higher number of units or uh, to Ms. Simpson's good point that, um, that the uh, mix of units is going to be as presented it for the conditional use. And that that's why council approved the conditional use is because we were sold a sales pitch of this is what we're going to do. And frankly, we want to hold the developer to doing what they said they were going to do. Okay. Does that give you enough direction? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can craft and get back to you with that. Okay, great. Next one. The next one, uh, of course, will be the easiest one we talk about this evening. Just <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, as you know, with the, the Amazon project, uh, the issue of truck traffic came up and how do we calculate truck traffic and what is a trip? Um, and so we tried to make some clarifications in the code where we didn't um, really change any of the definitions except for adding a definition of semi-trailer truck trip. Um, that you can see here. Otherwise, the thresholds between light industry and heavy logistics center still say the same about there being, you know, 50 truck trips, or we changed that just to clarify that it's semi-trailer truck trips. But otherwise that stayed the same, but we hopefully created a definition that helps better identify what that means. Okay, Mr. Mormon, you're first. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, I found this definition more confusing, actually, because um, in, in the beginning of the statement, it says a semi-truck trip. So I read that as singular, is inbound and outbound. But then the second part of the sentence then says that they shall be each counted as trips. So I'm, I'm confused. Can you help me with that? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so it basically is saying that a, a trip involves an inbound and an outbound, but that we consider that both movements of that trip, of that inbound and outbound, be considered a single trip. So the in and out, just for the definition of trips, is, a sing, is that, that movement in and out. That is considered a single trip, even though we wanted to clarify that that includes inbound and outbound. Okay, so I, I guess I do have a, a difficulty with that because I understand like ITE defines that differently and I and I and so does the state as under the ITE definitions. So I'm wondering why can't we just use the ITE definitions? And I'm thinking, you know, a, a truck leaves the facility, goes to another location overnight, and then comes back to the facility. I see that as two trips. But under this definition, I read that as one trip. And, and I understand that other, um, you know, like ITE in the state consider that two separate trips. We can, we can certainly do that. However, we have in the past for a long period of time considered, we, because we didn't have a definition, but we 
uh, applied this particular definition as policy to a number of instances where we just have to go back and look and see if that actually changed the category, changes the categorization of, of projects we actually already have out there. Um, but this was really just codifying what our policy has been for, for many years. Okay, well, I, I would suggest that we change that and go with the standards that are used by the state and others to make sure we're you know, complying with what everyone else is using. Jones? So not to go back to the first slide that we talked about with regard to fleet vehicles, but why are we singling out semi-truck trailers in truck in these trips? Um, but earlier we talked about those semi-trucks were, you know, they weren't necessarily counted in parking, but they were there and they were, you know, there for a purpose. And so they were moving in and out. But these fleet vehicles are also uh, coming in and out of that property for similar use. And so it seems to me like it should be a truck trip is anything that has a logoed or is in the, you know, in the complete distribution of, you know, whatever the business may be, um, should be included in the, in a truck trip or in, you know, in, in and out of a, of a facility, regardless of if it's a semi truck, a delivery van, anything that's, you know, got logoed or owned kind of under those same definitions of by the business. So one of the things I, I would just mention with that is that when we think about those two things, we're really trying to think about two different activities. So the land use is defined in light industrial and heavy logistics and, and those types of things as uh, categories of impact of how different things um, are uh, relate to the intensity of the use. So in heavy industrial, for example, one of the other kind of qualifications that makes it um, heavy industrial are other externalities such as odor or smoke or um, other things that need permitting by the EPA or something like that. So something that it has kind of a clear regulatory distinction in terms of, of a, a, a higher form of regulation. In light industry, we were trying to look at things like if it's going on in the building, then we don't necessarily care what you're doing, assuming it's legal. We don't necessarily care what you're doing, but you're doing it all kind of in the building. And then there's a certain amount of semi-truck traffic that's coming in and out of it in order to supply that use inside the building. When you're talking about a fleet, it's somewhat of a different scenario because that fleet is coming in and out of that building. That's home base is where that building is. Semi trucks aren't necessarily doing that. That's not their home base. That would be more of a heavy logistics center. This is more for the delivery of goods um, that are then uh, perhaps distributed as a light, light distribution is an allowed use in IL. Um, or it's manufacturing or, or something like that, and they're dispersing um, their goods. If you start getting into the uh, truck trip limitations on certain things, then uh, items that have fleets um, may be hitting that threshold and be putting unintentionally into um, a different category. An example is in Tower Place. Tower Place is the industrial development that is located at uh, 52nd and Ward uh, behind where the Office Depot is. Um, Millinder White and, and those types of businesses are back there. Um, one business in particular that's back there is Snow White. Snow White is a delivery service for laundry. Um, so they have 20, 25 vehicles, something like that. And they're going in collecting laundry um, from all over the place, um, collecting it there. And then it goes by semi-truck. I believe it goes to Colorado Springs, actually gets washed in Colorado Springs. The semi-truck brings it back, then it gets and sent out. So you would be getting into, is that now heavy logistics because of how you're defining fleet and trips? So really the, the idea of semi-truck trips was intended to be limited to kind of an externality activity as it relates to the bringing in of goods um, 
to a service separate from uh, a fleet activity. And I think that makes sense. The challenge, I think, <clears throat> in, you know, for instance, in the Amazon uh, case, there was, you know, a lot of consternation around the number of truck trips that were also related to the delivery vehicles. And so um, do we need to define semi-truck trips and delivery vehicle truck trips as part of this conversation? So our hope is that we're, we're, we're edging towards that. Um, so we tried to define semi-truck trips. That's with this definition. And if the number is not right or we need to look at that, we can do that. But then the fleet um, vehicle trips is defined in two ways. Number one, it's governed by the number of parking spaces that are allowed for fleet. So you're going to have a limited number of parking spaces um, for fleet vehicles. So right there, you're going to be limiting it. Um, however, um, Amazon happened to say that they were going to just do one in, one out every single day. Um, however, the definition of a fleet vehicle and the parking standards for fleet vehicles doesn't necessarily mean that those truck trips are limited to one, or excuse me, those fleet vehicle trips are limited to one trip a day. And therefore, that would need to be analyzed by the traffic study to understand, are you attributing more than one vehicle or fleet trip a day to that activity somewhat separate from the um, semi-truck um, activity, if that makes sense. But they are two different activities because of how they're being used and where they're going and, and the distribution of them. Yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. I just think that again, some more thoughtful conversation around the two different types of, of uh, vehicle movement. And you know, if I think about the criteria for approval, you know, what impacts do, does that vehicle movement have on the surrounding or adjacent areas? Sure. So, so I'll be quiet and listen to the rest of uh, my colleagues here. Pfeiffer. So, um, you know, how do we, how, when we talk about like land development and where you have a development in front of us and they come in with a traffic set and they say, well, this development will only generate 500 trips a day. Those are single trips, right? In other words, they leave, they go and they come back. Those are counted as two. So somebody leaves their house, goes to work, comes back, it's one. In residential, it is, I'm pretty sure. That is correct. Yeah. So why would we differentiate this one different than any development? Why don't we stay consistent with what we, 99% of the time we do, which is residential, because that's kind of what our data is. Why don't we just keep it consistent with trips being one way out, one way in, that's two trips? We can absolutely do that. There okay. is no issue with doing that. If you guys want to go in that direction, we're happy to do that. We just need to have common terminology because we use trips in two different ways. Yes. And that right there, I think, causes a lot of frustration from at least the citizens that have talked to me and I'm sure a few others. Um, is It seems in their eyes that we use the word trip um, maybe defined by land use, but it's also it seems to be willy-nilly in a way like, oh, we, we only say 50 trips here, which we mean round trips, which is really 100 trips. But over on this development, we talk about 500 trips, which are really 500 trips. So we just, I just, if we could just go that route, I, I rather completely, if it was one way, let's just make it simple. Let's all stay consistent with what trips are, regardless of what the vehicle is. That's so what I, my recommendation. I'm totally fine. We we are totally fine with going with the one way. The question, not to to carry this on, is then do you change the number to be consistent with what we had intended to do? and change the number to 100 trips a day? Or do you change that number? Uh, because that's the other part of the equation. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But I think some homework would need to be done by the team to go and look at what impacts that would have before we just unilaterally you know, make a decision. Because if there's not really many uh, you know, uh, businesses or industrial businesses that are not hitting that threshold, there's no reason to raise it if it's a problem. I think we need to go back to our homework of like Snow White or any of the others and say, what do we 
classify if we applied 50 trips, single trips, how, what businesses are impacted, if any, if there are, then what is the number? Because I don't know if any of our industrial light industrial, like in this case, actually ever hit a hundred. And do we, do we need to make it a hundred? Maybe it's 90, maybe it's 80. I don't know. Well, if you're, and just to, just to make sure I'm understanding, I mean, I'm still talking about the definition of a semi truck trip. And that being one direction, I'm okay. not talking about trips related to fleet. fleet. I think that's a different conversation. That, that's fine. And maybe I shouldn't use Snow White as the example. Okay. But, uh, I just want to make sure any, I'm clear. Anyone who takes an 18 wheeler to their yes. property, do they hit over 50? 50 single trips in and out. One, you know, each way is a, a trip. Yeah. So is there any? It, because if there isn't, then no, I wouldn't change the number. But if there is, then yeah, we need to probably adjust our code to match to support the businesses we have today uh, in, in the scenarios. But I think there's more homework to, to be around that. I just don't want to say, well, 50, let's just double it. Uh, you know, I, I think there could be some issues around that and maybe welcoming, uh, that could welcome some other businesses uh, that we may or may not be interested in. I don't know. Um, that's we'll the only cost to collect that data. Yeah, I think that would help us inform what that, that number should be. Um, before we make the decision. And then I just, just so you know, I, I did confirm earlier today with our um, staff traffic team, it is one direction is one trip, just so we're staying consistent with CDOT standards too. Okay, Ms. Simpson. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'd like to echo some of my colleagues' sentiments. Um, I believe we should be in line with the standard one, uh, this because this is something that's caused a lot of consternation um, for the past year now, um, the definition of a truck trip. So for the sake of sheer simplicity, um, Ryan, you said the team's fine with it. Moving it to one way is a truck trip. Um, I think that eliminates a lot of confusion, particularly because not all routes are very nice and clean round trips. You go to one spot, then you come back. You could have multiple different locations of uh, stops, uh, particularly um, considering uh, businesses that might have more than one location. So I think it just helps tidy it up and it becomes more normalized, particularly for um, operations that may be coming to Arvada for the first time and they've worked elsewhere. This is how it's done elsewhere. So just standardizing that is a good idea. Um, and then in terms to Mr. In regards to Mr. Pfeiffer's point about the homework, I agree in terms of raising that number, I want to know what's common. Again, if we're going to standardize this, we need to look at what our neighbors are doing. What What is the truck trip total for Lakewood, Wheat Ridge, Golden, Westminster? Um, they may be the same. They may have some differences and perhaps we come in somewhere in the middle there. We got to see what makes sense. Uh, going back to the Amazon project, um, I recall it was going to be 42 semi-truck trips round trip. That would be 84 one way. So that doesn't bring us to 100, and that would have been one of the largest scale things we had seen in the um, in Arvada. So I, I'm not necessarily um, just saying, yep, double it. That makes the most sense. I want to see what's common to our neighboring cities so that we stay standardized with those. And if we happen to have an existing facility that does um, potentially get itself reclassified, we can always create some kind of grandfathered in for existing facilities so that they don't have their operations disrupted by us trying to um, standardize things moving forward. So those are just kind of uh, my initial thoughts. All my, all my questions got asked by, the, by my colleagues. So uh, I apologize, I don't have any questions for the team, just some thoughts. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll echo Ms. Simpson with, I, th I think we're probably best off by defining a truck trip as one way. And I would agree as well. I'd like to hear from the team about what the number should be. And I guess my question for Ms. Morris is if we have an existing business that would be reclassified, does this really even apply to them? I mean, because they've already been approved. They have already been approved. Um, theoretically, if we change the standards for what businesses are supposed to be within a particular zoning district, that could create some, at least a, at least a potential problem with code enforcement type complaints. Now, um, we can talk as a group and I'd want some time to sit down and talk with our city team about exactly how we handle that. 
uh, because you're right, we have approved it. So it wouldn't seem fair to consider it to be something different than what we've approved it to be or where we've approved it to be located. Uh, so we'll have to look through potential solutions for that. Yeah, and you know, if, even if they're not in violation now, if they increased uh, trips down the road, could they then, you know, would that trigger um, having to come back in or something of like that? So I think we got to look at that. The ones that, you know, one that comes to mind for me is prescient, right? you know, because I know that they, you know, and, and I don't know what other major, you know, semi type operations we have, but I think we need to look at some of that so that we don't have any unintended consequences of, of the actions we're taking. I certainly support going to what I believe is a more universal approach of a trip as one way. So very good. Um, yeah, we yeah. can definitely take a look at that. I just wanted to point out one thing that maybe gives a little level of comfort on this subject. And that is the difference between um, the permitted use of light industry in the IL district and the heavy, uh, heavy logistics center one is a permitted use, one is a conditional use. So you wouldn't actually be shutting anybody out. You would just have greater discretion depending on what that trip number is. Uh, we also do have a provision, we can talk with Rachel and Emily about this a little more, but we already have a provision in the code that talks about if something becomes a conditional use as a result of the code, that it is essentially not even grandfathered, but it remains legal. And we'll have to see if we could apply that in this situation, but I think there. Were, I think we've got some ability to get you to a level of comfort on this, regardless of what the number is we we pick. Good. Okay. Right. And then the very last one is just um, there was some discussion about the appeal process and how we would approach that. And really, we aren't proposing any changes to the appeal process, other than allowing for this notification uh, distance to get greater whether it's this thousand square feet or whatever other number we come up with, anytime there would be an appeal, that same group of people, again, regardless of the distance, would get a notification of, of an appeal being filed or would have, I'm sorry, would have the ability to appeal a decision. Fair enough. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is one that, that I definitely want to weigh in on. I think that the salient question here was whether an appeal, what, what, what exactly is an appeal or what are they appealing? Is it, is it city council just reviewing the community development director's decision or does the appeal, an appeal take the form of essentially a new hearing on the project? In other words, is it a way for somebody who appeals a community development deci director's decision, a way to kind of redirect it to council for a council decision versus just an affirmation of the community development director following the the, uh, the the rules in the book, you know, our checkup on their rules in the book. And, uh, you know, for me, I've thought about this one a whole lot over the last six months um, as we've had one of these and uh, potentially may have others. And and I really feel strongly that the an appeal should take the form of a new hearing in front of city council. Um, to me, I really see one of the things trying to balance in this land development code is, you know, we went from virtually everything we saw being a PUD requiring planning commission and city council. And we were wrong at some of that. There were times when we were, um, you know, we were approving a Chase Bank in front of a King Supers where they were meeting all the development standards. And, and it seemed like that should be able to be done uh, administratively. And now we're approving very little. And in fact, a couple of conversations I've had with developers along Ralston Road here recently is they are really enamored, like way too enamored with the administrative decision, like they will do about anything for it to not be a, a city council decision. And I think there needs to be something that's in balance there, whether it be a combination of what cases go to city council versus become administrative appeals and in my eye we're kind of a little too heavy on the administrative side now or whether it's a process like this appeals process where somebody who who does have a problem with a development or with a, a decision by the community development director can trigger kind of a 
what would have been kind of a traditional hearing in front of their elected representatives. Um, and so for me, you know, the, what's on the slide as far as, you know, a thousand feet of, of, of not notification or whatever, I don't have any problem with that. I think that's all fine. It's more for me, the question is what's being appealed here? What, what form does an appeal take? Um, and, and I think I differ with the staff's recommendation that an appeal be just a, uh, just a kind of a, a, a relook of did the community development director follow all the, all the, all the words in the code. I, I, I struggle on this from, from both sides on this because unfortunately naysayers, you know, anti-growthers or whatever can immediately jump on the appeal process to delay and delay can kill, mm -hmm. you know, kill projects that might be a perfectly good project that we, you know, ultimately would say, yes, this should be approved. So I, I worry a little bit about having it be in a de novo hearing. Uh, and, and in fact, we got in trouble last time, as I recall, because some of us initially thought we were doing a de novo hearing and then had to be educated that it's really looking at whether or not the uh, planning director um, dotted the I's and crossed the T's and if there was evidence to support their decision. Um, and, and so I tend to go with the more traditional appeal approach of, uh, of was there evidence in the record to support the decision made by the, by the director? So what do others think? I always chimed in because nobody had their hands up yet. So, <laughs> yes, Lauren. Apologies, I'm on my phone, and every time I go for mute, it just flashes at me. Um, I tend to be in line with uh, Mr. Marriott's thinking here. It, I understand where you're coming from, Mayor, and I certainly don't want the process to be abused. Uh, my hope here, though, is that, you know, appeals are expensive, at least the, the couple that I have been a part of. The, uh, the plaintiffs doing the appeal, they, they put in many, many hours. They put it, they hired lawyers. They got quite financially burdened by it. Um, and so I don't think that would be a, an undertaking that any group would do lightly. Um, there, there's so much at stake to prove an appeal and to overturn a decision. Um, I think that in and of itself would be a deterrent to people using them frivolously. That's never to say it wouldn't be abused. Anything can be right for abuse. But hopefully there, you know, it would be a common sense determent um, that people just couldn't pursue it unless they were deeply passionate and knowing that they were in the right, that uh, this project was not in line with what the community said. And, and I, I do agree also with Mr. Marriott's sentiments that, you know, I, I if I were a developer, I certainly want to wouldn't want to have to take something before the city council because I would be afraid of those naysayers. Um, and so I, I can see a lot of uh, developers preferring it not to have to come to us. But this goes to Mr. Pfeiffer's earlier point that we're the representatives of the community. We're the ones who they speak to that they trust to be their voice. So if there is a way for something that's truly contentious to be able to come before us, I, I think that would be appropriate. Mr. Jones. Yeah, this <clears throat> to me feels like an entirely different conversation, which takes us back to um, really the, the rewrite and the, the changes that we made to allow more administrative type approvals. Um, and, you know, and, and, but I agree, I think that there are some approvals that uh, make a ton of sense to be administratively done. Um, and then there are others that uh, feel like we still ought to be seen. So as it relates to the appeals process, um, I, I think that the appeals process as written, I would agree with the mayor that the appeals process as written is for the use of, of, of in the context of, of that. But I think if we're, if we're talking about um, approval process and giving the community direct community development director administrative authority um, or removing some of that authority, I think that's another discussion for maybe another night on, you know, did we go too far? And if we went too far, how would we pull that back? And what does that look like? So that's my thoughts. 
I, I think that I, I tend to agree with Mr. Jones that I think that's the discussion. You'll recall that over the last few years, I would frequently say when we would have a 7-0 vote on a project that, you know, we would sort of classify as a no-brainer of, you know, why, why can't these be approved administratively, reduce the cost, and, and be able to get things done in a more, um, uh, in a faster fashion. Uh, but there are clearly projects that are controversial. We know from the get-go that they're gonna be controversial. And so let's just have them come to city council uh, because frankly, we know whichever side loses at the administrative level, there's gonna probably be an appeal. So I think that does deserve some more discussion. Mr. Pfeiffer? Yeah, and then, but let's look at the pendulum that we saw last week with the fence, right? Right, that's one that, why the heck did that come to city council? Yeah, so that one came to city council, but yet, you know, we have some administrative things happening that we don't see that maybe we should be seeing, you know. Um, I'll give one example that I asked about, and sorry, Ryan, put you on the spot, but the 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 garage, uh, mechanics garage over on Indiana and, and 82nd, we, that's going to be done, or whatever street, Highway 72, 86 Parkway, whatever you want to call that road. But that's going to be done administratively, but yet it's going to face possibly, well, Maybe, I don't know, I don't have the answer, Ryan, but it's right next door to residential houses. And so we won't see that, but yet there could be 15, 20 cars stored in front of a mechanic shop in front of this person's uh, living room window that was never planned for. And they call it mixed use. And so I, 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 think, I think we need, <laughs> I don't wanna say we wanna rewrite again, but there needs to be some, it just, it's not making any rhythm or rhyme for me on these in the current code. So. I think I'm hearing that we wanna have more discussions on, on what, what projects truly should be dealt with administratively and which ones need to come before city council. Am I hearing council to that? Yes, I'm getting head nods, which, you know, I, we don't have to start over from scratch, certainly. I mean, we've done a lot of, you guys have done a lot of hard work and, and, um, but we, but there are times where we're sort of scratching our head in, 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 pra, in, in doing this in practice. And, then, and that's part of the experience is we got to do a few of these and, and learn from it and not just be locked in because, you know, well, we don't want to revisit this for another 10 years or whatever. So, you know, let's let's fine tune it and let's do some fine tuning here. So we're certainly um, up to the challenge and we'll move forward and, and, and have no issue with that whatsoever. Um, I did want to give a little bit of an anecdotal um, statement just because it, it, it goes along with some of the things that you're saying. Um, the, the anecdotal um, statement is that I think that the development community also acknowledges the fact of the appeal process and not, and not getting to um, Council Member Marriott's point of whether it's a de novo or if it's a review of the community development decision. The, the challenge is, is what's going on with that appeal is that it's a site plan. And so now you're not appealing, you're, you're appealing the entire process, which is faster because you're not doing a PDP first or a PUD first, and then an FDP, which is kind of two parts, um, and it costs more um, because you're doing the preliminary part here, um, and then you're doing the FDP part here, which has like the fine details of like all the engineering and, and the utility work and the traffic studies and all those other things. But now you basically take in the work of an FDP and you put it into a site plan, so that costs a lot more. And your guarantee is a little bit less because if you think that you're being approved administratively, that's fine. You're willing to put all of your money there because as long as you check all the boxes, you can get approved administratively. But if the idea is, is that anybody can appeal or not anybody, but anybody with standing can appeal, it puts that more at risk. So developers have told, talked to me about it and they have told me they would rather do a PUD because they're not spending so much money up front, they're just doing the preliminary exercise 
then go to city council and get their decision. Now, the difference is, is that it goes from a six month process that we're talking about now, that does not include an appeal to a 12 to 18 month process if you do it the other way. So the reason why the code swung in the direction it did is because we prioritize timing, which we have increased immensely, um, but we've done it at the um, expense, if you will, of, of some of the council's discretion um, and, and perhaps some additional community input. We have tried to put with the um, notification of administrative decision and all those things in there so that there is a lot more community kind of conversation, particularly around administrative things, but we can certainly go back and we can look at that, even knowing that some of the decisions, uh, some developers would prefer the PUD, and we've been trying to get away from that, even though it takes longer, it's a little bit cheaper and it takes away the uncertainty. So if we have that in our, our tool bag more and offering that more, it's a possibility but then we also have to balance that with knowing that the process is gonna take longer and is council okay with that? So that's a statement more than you, nobody has to answer that. Yeah, let me, let me ask a quick question on that before I go to Mr. Jones. So is, it, is the potential there that a developer could have the option of which way to go? Um, and you know, saying, you know, I'm willing to take more time. It might be a little bit cheaper time is money and so they have to balance all that out but they make a business decision of I'd rather go the PUD route versus the administrative with the with the potential of an appeal yeah and, and even in in high in highly controversial ones we've been even I wouldn't say steering them but we've been certainly upfront about the possibility of doing a PUD um, because uh, they would it, and being forthright about the fact that it takes longer, but they don't have to spend as much money to get to a decision from council. Yeah. So I is more, more just a comment and I'll be the first to admit, I don't understand the timeline for a PUD and what all of the steps are that have to take place to get from, you know, original idea to approval in 18 months. Um, so I would just ask the, the, the city team to look at that and say, you know, if we were to, to go, you know, or encourage more people to go down this PUD route as an option, um, how do we improve our process so that it's not 18 months, it's nine months? You know, can that can that really be cut in half? I don't know. So it would just be more of a, of, of a challenge to the team to, to look at the development timeline and all of the things that have to happen. And I get that that probably means increasing um, headcount uh, to, you know, to take care of all that. So I understand there are pros and cons to speed, um, but how, how can we speed up the process without um, impacting, um, in my world, SG&A expense, um, you know, adversely? So it's just more of a comment. No, no need for a response on that. Marriott? Yeah, I just wanted to make an additional comment um, and kind of an observation. And, and I think the Kipling townhomes process is the one that really comes to mind when I think about it. You know, the, the, the original development proposed there was, you know, the, not well received by the community. And the community development director, I think, did a, an excellent job working with an excellent developer to kind of come up with something that... Uh, I, I believe will be better accepted by the community and, and difficult negotiations and all that to do that. But really that the, my observation is there that the community development director was in the wrong position there, not the decision that he made, but just that, that that's kind of our job is to, to um, look at PUDs. You know, the whole premise of a PUD is, is that you're asking for something and as a developer, you're going to deliver a better project because of this PUD process. And, um, you know, in this particular case, the community development director was in that spot doing that, which I don't think is really the spot that they want to be in, um, that there's got to be some way for things like that to end up where they really should end up, which is in front of the citizens representatives, not in front of uh, a, a team member. Um, and so, you know, if we just think back of that one, I think that one proves, or proves it just it illustrates a little bit of the example that I think I'm talking about. 
um, about when we when we look at this. And I, you know wh whether that happens through the appeals process or whether the appeals process is part of it, or it's a, just a different part of the land development code, a different look at how we approve different things. That doesn't really matter to me, but it, it just it's it's an issue as far as I'm concerned. I don't see any other hands. I think uh, some of our team will probably go home tonight and scratch their heads and <laughs> know that we've uh, added to their plate rather than uh, giving them clear uh, direction that, yeah, we love everything and, and go forth and just do what you had initially proposed. But it's been a good discussion. Um, you know, I think, as I said, I think this is part of the fine tuning and we're not Throwing it, throwing out the uh, the model we have right now, but we're going to keep improving it. Okay, it's um, it's seven forty seven. Does anybody need a break before we move into our second? Uh, uh, Ms. Simpson would like a brief break. Let's take let's um, let's reconvene at um, what seven fifty five.
for our second workshop item. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, we will have a quarterly bond project update and we'll start with Director of Public Works, Don Wick. Mr. Wick. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of council. Thanks for having us here this evening. Um, tonight, we are going to present our fourth quarter update regarding the bond projects, which I think everyone knows is uh, Ralston Road Phase 2 and the West 72nd Avenue underpass project um, that we've been working on now for a couple of years. Um, we're excited to give the presentation tonight. There's a lot of work underway and a lot of things have been happening. So we're glad to be here to provide those updates. To get us started, um, I am going to introduce to you all Bill Cornelius, who is our roadway design manager. Um, Bill uh, has some new teammates that he would like to introduce to you, as well as to discuss a couple of programmatic changes that we have recently completed. And that'll get us started. And then um, from there, we'll jump into the bond projects themselves. So Bill, I'll turn this over to you. Uh, thanks, Don. Thanks for the introduction and good evening, everyone. Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council and a uh, warm welcome to a uh, new council member, Mr. Mormon. Uh, we really look forward to working with you on uh, some of the transportation projects uh, and challenges that we have coming before us in the, in the coming months and years. Uh, yes, we do have a number of uh, programmatic changes, as Don mentioned, and some new team members. Uh, I guess first and foremost, I'd like to uh, uh, maybe pull up the slides that we have available. Next slide, please. So we have, uh, we have uh, with us this evening, uh, our new pavement management team, and we have a new project manager for the 72nd Avenue project. Uh, in quarter two of this year, we had uh, some staff changes, uh, the addition of uh, the new assistant city engineer position, uh, which uh, was, uh, was awarded to after a, a, a close contest, and I'm, I, I say that tongue in cheek, uh, Chris Lisberg was promoted to that position and that left his position position. So um, that left a uh, project manager position open for the 72nd Avenue uh, project. Um, and then in addition to that, we uh, in the quarter two, we also moved the uh, pavement program, pavement management program, if you will, from the streets department over to engineering. And the thought process um, for the reason of moving that uh, pavement management program was that uh, our ADA transition plan um, really uh, came to the city and, and we, we saw the challenges of that and the connection with the pavement program and how we could uh, interconnect the, uh, the challenges of the two programs together. And we, our leadership team thought that there would be a, a, an engineering component to that. And so it was moved uh, uh, by decision of leadership to uh, come to engineering for oversight within my team. So tonight, before I introduce the new project manager for 72nd Avenue, I would like to introduce our new pavement management team. Uh, we had some vacancies uh, due to a promotion uh, with the retirement of our streets manager. Uh, and so that left that opening. And then we had a, re a resignation of our pavement coordinator as well. So that left a vacant team. We've recently filled that team uh, with uh, Sean LaHockey. He comes to us with about 20 years of experience in the sector. He was also uh, involved in the pavement management program for Commerce City for a number of years. So uh, we're very, very pleased to have Sean on board as our new pavement. We think he's going to do great things for the program, and uh, he's already indicated that he's well in tune with what our needs are. And then secondly, for the pavement program, uh, we also have Christine Biddle, who was uh, working within the streets department for a couple of years on the administrative side, and she... Uh, she also was well in tune with the way the program, uh, program worked before I moved to engineering. And she also was the owner of a concrete company. So we felt her experience was solid and she uh, rounded out a very, very good team that we have now. So uh, uh, I, I, I wish uh, this team well, and I'm looking forward to working with them for all of our pavement management challenges. And uh, uh, virtual world here, so they really can't stand up, but uh, if you could just raise your hand, if you have your cameras on, and uh, just sort of introduce yourself there. Okay, very good, and thank you for joining us this evening. 
Uh, and now, now secondly, on our 72nd Avenue project, as I mentioned, I was part of that transition back in quarter two as well, which left my position open. And so we, we did a search for my replacement. We had a, a certain set of uh, characteristics, uh, skill sets that we were looking for. So we interviewed a number of people uh, and one of those candidates really stood out uh, to us for my replacement. So um, Britton Thomas is our new project manager on 72nd Avenue. Uh, Britton also comes to us with about 20 years of experience in both the public and private sector. Um, he has been working closely with me over the last four months to make this transition uh, very seamless. Um, he is now fully in charge of our CMGC team. He, uh, he has shown me that he has uh, very good decision-making skills. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he does solid research. Uh, every time I've asked Britton to do something for me, he, uh, I ask him for X, he comes back with X and Y and sometimes Z. So he has shown himself very capable, very trustworthy. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you, and I'm very pleased uh, to have him on board, Britton Thomas. Just raise your hand, please. All right. So we, uh, we wish them all well and uh, welcome to the team. And with that, I'm gonna transition this over to Chris Lisberg to give us uh, Ralston phase one updates. Thank you, Bill, really appreciate it. Um, I just wanna take a quick uh, brief aside to, uh, ne next slide, first of all, please, um, to, uh, to really just give a quick update on Ralston Road phase one, mostly for the benefit of our newest council members. Uh, While well, Ralston Road Phase 1 is not technically a bond project, it does, as you noted here on the map with the one, uh, tie in a Ralston Road Phase 2. In reality, making a lot of the similar improvements that Phase 2 slated to do, whether it be streetscaping, wider sidewalks, or, or wider driving lanes. Uh, next slide, please. Ralston Road uh, Phase 1 was substantially completed in July, and we've been working on some punch lists or corrective items since. Uh, during that time frame. Uh, now, typically this phase of a, of a project doesn't take as long as this has, but given some of the supply chain issues, uh, we had some long lead times on some of the final materials uh, to complete that project. So with that being said, uh, we feel like the schedule dovetailed quite nicely with Rolston Road Phase 2, and uh, we are well on our way to uh, close out of the project. We anticipate having uh, the books closed on that in the first quarter of next year. Uh, with final reimbursement from CDOT and, and final payout of, of some invoices that are still rolling in from the likes of Excel and other parties. Um, with that, unless there are any questions, I'd love to roll into phase two as well. Next slide, please. And Trang, you can take it away. You're, you're muted, Trang. You, you may have been employee of the year, but you're still muted. Thank you. <laughs> I have my camera on. I thought I was unmuted. Well, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. So next slide, please. Uh, first off, we'll start with the status and schedule of Roston phase two. Um, currently, we have spent approximately 43% of the city's budget of $17.83 million. Um, the graphic below shows the five-year timeline from when we first started on the design and then the right-of-way acquisition. And right now we are in the construction phase. Um, the red dot shows that we are on week uh, 33 of a two-year um, contract with um, Hammond Infrastructure. And then the pink dot uh, also shows the end of the construction. Um, as well, the two-year construction to be completed in May of 2022, um, excuse me, May of 2023. And of which, um, if we maintain that schedule, we will um, finish approximately nine months ahead of the five-year um, bond deadline. Next, please. In regards to the project facing, um, as shown right now for the traffic control, this is based on Hammond infrastructure. Um, proposal. The city did give them the first notice uh, to proceed one um, starting on May 3rd of 2021. That would start the two year contract. And also, the city did give them um, a, a notice to proceed 1A for them to come into the private property owners' um, properties to um, 
start the removal of all of the curb, uh, um, the curb cuts, the, all of the um, sidewalk, curb and gutter, um, of which started the temporary construction easement for the rental of two years. And so right now we are anticipating them to complete um, the north winding um, between Yukon to Estes approximately no later than July of 2022. Um, currently, we do have uh, utilities construction as well. Um, we do have new um, water line uh, relocation, um, as well as storm sewer um, removal and replacement, sanitary sewer, and all of the conduit for the irrigation line and the pedestrian lights. And also last month, we did uh, issue a notice to proceed, uh, notice to proceed to um, for the smaller portion of the south winding between Estes to Garrison. And this portion of the project, Hammond is required to complete no later than October of 2022. Um, in regards to the traffic signal replacement, um, Hammond and their subcontractor have installed most of the caissons for all of the four um, intersections. And then lastly, for the notice to proceed three, we are anticipating to give them that around um, April of next year, to which include um, the other half of the winding. And so as just a note, um, all of the notices to proceed, they do overlap just due to constraints of the time reconstruction easement in which the city agreed to um, grant all of these property for one year only. Next, please. Um, this is um, a little bit more detail on the budget and expenditure. Um, currently, right now, this slide hasn't changed from the last update. Um, I do, however, want to point out that um, for the miscellaneous and contingency of $2 million, approximately $200,000 um, includes the oral investment of the $3.5 million for the um, streetscape uh, element of the project. Um, the city did receive the final and last payment of $1.75 million um, earlier this month, and that's been confirmed with finance. Next, please. Regarding the right of acquisition, um, this is the current dashboard um, that we have um, summarizing our status. The project um, is going to impact 49 properties, of which 49 parcels. The city um, does have possession. We have closed and recorded um, on all of the documents. However, uh, two parcels, um, it's taking a little bit longer for them to close just because of the process of each of the bank, um, just due to the um, challenges of some of the, the, the loans that the property owners have. And then the last piece of um, the puzzle, it's the two remaining uh, parcel that unfortunately the city did have to file for condemnation so that we would take um, immediate possession in order to advertise for construction um, the end of last year. And the two properties, one it's um, more on the east side um, of the project, the northeast corner. Um, this is a vet clinic at 7709 Roston Road. And we are scheduled for a um, valuation trial um, next year. Um, however, um, this Thursday, um, we are having a mediation a meeting between the city and the landowner to hopefully um, settle uh, this, um, to come into a settlement agreement, excuse me, so that we could eventually avoid um, valuation trial. And the mediation uh, meeting is required by the court um, as a part of the right of way acquisition uh, process. And then the last piece, it's um, on the west side of the project, southwest corner of the um, project limit. And this is at 9110 Roston Road. Um, this is the Arvada Appliance business. And we are scheduled for a valuation trial um, next year as well. Next, please. Um, there are several um, recent challenges um, for this project. And I believe for any um, project, the utilities are always on top of the list, both known and unknown. Um, for Roston Road, just due to our um, aging row, of course, consequently, the, the utilities are all as well. Um, we have had to remove and replace um, 
approximately more than 50 to 60 percent of the storm sewer that, that were um, not anticipated to be um, removed nor um, budgeted um, in the project. But fortunately for us, we do have um, a healthy contingency, a force account of $800,000. So um, up to now, any of the utilities that we have um, coming up that obviously uh, were a surprise to us, we have been able to use um, the force account to pay for these additional um, removal and replacement. And then secondly is um, public expectations. Um, unfortunately, some of the reactions that we did receive from the resident, uh, whether their business owner or just people driving through the project, they are pretty um, unreasonable. Um, I wanna think, point out to a saying, it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, a lot of the progress that we have had so far, unfortunately, all of them is um, utilities, is underground. Um, Sidewise, they have started on the project back in um, March. And just due to a lot of the activities um, along the corridor, we sometimes have approximately five to seven contractor and subcontractor work on the project. And so for the gas main relocation, Sidewise actually worked during the night for several weeks so that they would not be um, in Hammond's way or in each other's way for other contractors. So just keeping in mind, um, they were obviously respectful of our request so that everybody could uh, get their work done. So again, outside of mind, it's just that um, if we don't see something, we assume that nothing has been done on the project. Unfortunately, that is, um, the, the part is from the truth because the contractor, all of them are partners at Excel, CenturyLink and Comcast have been working diligently um, to push the project forward and to um, work in a timely manner so that they could uh, meet our schedule. Next, please. Um, these are some of the um, high profile uh, activities that's going on um, along the corridor. So for right now, for the um, eastern portion of the waterline relocation, Hammond has installed approximately 90% um, of the proposed design um, between Brandwood to Allison. We have about 95% um, done. And also um, this doesn't include um, some of the fire line and, and surfaces and fire, the, the lateral um, connections to the main and then for the Allison portion of the waterline relocation, um, due to just the uh, construction of Roston Road, the existing AC line is being uh, replaced by a, a PVC line. So obviously it's an upgrade to our infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have um, Excel, Comcast and, and CenturyLink um, relocating the overhead lines to underground. And um, as of right now, all of the um, new um, facilities have been installed. And my understanding is that um, Comcast right now is doing the um, cut over. And so once they are off the overhead lines, then Excel Energy could start removing a lot of the power poles um, starting um, mid, uh, mid with next week. And in regards to the utilities for the storm sewer, we have approximately 30% completed. And then next, it would be the construction of curb gutter and sidewalk um, on the north side between Allison to Yukon. Um, our schedule is that Tao Brothers will be doing the concrete work um, starting as early as this Wednesday. And then if um, weather um, permits, um, we are talking about the possibility of paving as well, as long as the temperature doesn't go below 40 degrees. And so I believe this is the end of the updates for Austin phase two. Um, are there any questions? Don't see any hands. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll pass next to, to Bryn to give the updates on 72nd Avenue. Okay, good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, and uh, our new council member, welcome. Um, my name is Burton Thomas. I'm gonna be presenting 72nd Avenue uh, bond project. 
And uh, just for uh, our new council member, I'll go through a quick overview of the project. You can see it's on the upper portion of the map here. Uh, we go from Kipling on the east side uh, to, uh, we usually say Sims Street, it's the most major street there, but we actually go a little bit west of that to uh, Swadley Court. So Kipling Street to Swadley Court, 1.2 miles long, our budget is 64 and a half million. And we've separated into three construction packages. Uh, construction package number one is mostly utilities. Uh, construction package number two goes from Swadley Court uh, to Oak Street. And then construction package number three goes from Oak Street to Kipling. And that includes the underpass of uh, Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just a quick agenda of what I'll be talking about tonight. Um, go over the right of way, budget, our schedule, um, Union Pacific coordination, and then uh, community feedback at the end. Next slide, please. And as far as right of way goes, uh, we had 72 parcels uh, to acquire. We've acquired 71 of them. Uh, we did have one of those parcels uh, go to eminent domain. Um, and we've been granted um, immediate possession and the valuation trial will be next year at some point. Uh, you can see that we've uh, used most of our budget here. I believe we'll go over by five to 10%. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a quick overview of our total budget. We've spent about a sixth of the budget so far. And on the bottom of the slide, you can see our schedule at this point. Um, CP1's kind of in that pink color there. We are under construction there. Uh, we're expecting to be complete uh, by June of next year. Uh, CP2 in the brown, uh, we are scheduled to give a notice to proceed in March of next year. And CP3, which is uh, includes that uh, underpass of the Union Pacific Railroad, we are expecting a notice to proceed in September of next year. Next slide, please. Here's a quick overview of our pre-construction budget. You can see that uh, pre-construction services, that's our contractor. Um, he's used 100% of his pre-construction services at this point. And our design engineer has essentially used 100% uh, of their budget so far. Uh, due to some of the uh, delays that we've had in the project, this is from Excel, um, Union Pacific Railroad, and also a little bit from our uh, right-of-way acquisition, we are expecting change orders from uh, both SEMA, our, our contractor, and Muller, our design engineer. Uh, next slide, please. And here's our construction budget. Right now, uh, the only package under construction is CP1. We've used about a third of that budget so far. Um, CP2 and CP3 will start next year. And then our material procurement package, this is primarily the steel that'll be used in the underpass uh, of the railroad. Um, we are closely uh, watching that. Um, steel prices have been up and down quite a bit over the last year. And so we may choose to purchase the steel a little bit early in order to get a better price. Um, we can't do that until we get to uh, an approval of our 60% bridge package uh, from the railroad. And uh, we're hoping that that comes early next year. And at that point, we can take a look at the steel prices and also hauling prices and, and storage prices um, and make a decision on whether to uh, sort of cut loose that package or not. Next slide, please. This is our uh, construction schedule for CP1. Again, uh, it's under construction and we're looking for uh, completion in about June of next year. Next slide, please. CP2, uh, we're looking to start uh, in March of next year. We do have 100% of the right of way acquired to start this package, so no, no delays uh, from that. Um, we did receive 100% plans for uh, costing uh, just last Friday, 
And so our contractor is, uh, will be working diligently over the next month to put some numbers to, to all those quantities in, in the package and, and we'll be able to see uh, where we are in the budget at that point. Um, construction will take us through the end of 2023 on this package. Next slide, please. And um, this was presented at the at the last update, but um, CP2 was delayed um, from October of this year to March of next year um, due to Excel Energy delays and also a little bit from right of way acquisition. Um, we did find that the new schedule lines up paving a little bit better with the uh, spring, summer, fall kind of paving um, timeframe. Uh, there are less delays um, from paving in the winter. Generally those batch plants and, and uh, asphalt plants shut down through the winter. And so you kind of have a delay through there, but this schedule lined up a little bit better. And so we're seeing some efficiency there. Um, so that's good. Next slide, please. Uh, CP3, and so this uh, includes the Union Pacific uh, underpass. We are currently at 60% bridge plans, and those have been submitted to the uh, railroad just recently, last week. And um, we we're told that we should expect a 45 day roughly turnaround from them. So. They're running a little bit behind what they usually do, but uh, hopefully we'll see some comments back sooner than later. Um, we are targeting a summer of 2024 completion on this package. And uh, just to give a quick uh, overview of the whole package, there are actually six parts to, uh, to this. Um, we have the PUC application, the construction and maintenance agreement with uh, Union Pacific Railroad. We have the roadway plans, uh, the shoe fly plans, which is the track. Um, we have to divert the track while we build the bridge. And so that's a whole set of plans. Then we have the roadway bypass plans, and then we have the bridge plans. So they all have to come together um, to 100% uh, next year. And then uh, um, we can get to construction, hopefully uh, at the end of the summer in September. Next slide, please. And here's our just coordination, coordination with uh, Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, in gray at the top, we've already completed. Um, and then in purple are the bridge plans and the green is everything else, shoe fly, bypass, and uh, all the agreements. Right now we're sitting at 60% bridge plans and they're submitted to Union Pacific right now. Um, we need approval on those to then do a site visit for the shoe fly, that's the track um, bypass, the track bypass. And so all these things have to happen kind of in line. It's, it's Union Pacific's uh, just their way they do things. They make you do this before that that kind of thing. And so you can see that uh, our plans for the temporary bypass and the shoe fly are only at 30%, but then everything comes together at 90%, hopefully in April, and then moves on to 100% shortly after that. And then we can get the agreements going and the PUC application, get everything wrapped up um, in the summer, and then early fall, September, hopefully we'll be at construction. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly is just the community feedback. And um, Mr. Marriott, this is gonna be a little bit different than, with, than what you heard last Wednesday. I've gotten a little more information on what this slide shows. Um, this slide actually shows uh, the number of contacts uh, throughout the project with uh, the uh, landowners that we were acquiring right of way from. And so this didn't include um, any complaints, comments, or questions that's come about since uh, construction started. And uh, I do have those numbers. Um, we've only received between 10 and 15 uh, comments or, and um, complaints uh, in the last two months. And the vast majority of them are, are because of uh, 
there's temporary fence along the back um, backyards of many of the homeowners uh, properties currently. And we had some wind events. And so some of the fence got blown over and then we have um, some fabric material that sort of blocks your sight through the fence um, and that got blown away as well. So the mass majority of those comments have come from uh, temporary fence uh, problems that the, uh, the contractor has um, quickly taken care of. And with that, that concludes my uh, presentation. Are there any questions I can answer? I don't see any, um, while well, people are thinking, are we gonna at some point in time uh, get some uh, graphics or whatever so we can sort of see what the layout for the shoe fly and things of that nature are gonna look like? Yes, we can. Um, like I said, we're at kind of 30% right, right. now, but yeah. we can, we can uh, yeah, I can put something together and share with the group. Absolutely. Great, Ms. Simpson? Uh, I actually, it's not a question. I wanted to say thank you to you, Britton. That was my question from Wednesday about those contacts and complaints and where were they originating from and what were they for? So knowing that it's about a, a wind event, well, well, those of us who live in the foothills, we understand wind. So, okay. I, I appreciate you uh, bringing that information to us tonight and following up. Of course. If I could uh, just jump in with one slightly related item as well that we wanted to, to bring to mention in the spirit of in, inquiring on graphics and and, uh, and some more information, we have uh, we have uh, recently within Public Works uh, established a drone program and we're regularly flying these corridors. So in an effort to be more transparent and, and also provide a, a different angle to see the progress of projects. Uh, we are uploading that information to YouTube. We, we currently have those up on the City of Arvada YouTube channel and are, are working on our messaging to get that onto the city website, project pages and, and other avenues for distribution, whether it be social media and such as well. So I think the project site looks totally different than when you're flying through it at 40 miles an hour. So, Chris, are you doing that for uh, Ralston Road as well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Yeah, maybe Mr. Devin, if you could send us the appropriate link for being able to connect into those so we can view those. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll see if we can get those included in one of the weekly memos coming up with the links on right. there so you can you can experience the overflight of both of these projects. That'd be great. Okay, Mr. Mormon. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Thomas, for that presentation. Um, one question that I have is, is about a um, concern that was raised by a constituent about uh, dumping occurring from the project, you know, after uh, at night, after hours, during sleeping hours. Is, and so I just want to follow up and understand that has been taken care of. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, we did receive that comment. I think it was uh, maybe about two weeks ago or so. And um, that particular um, incident, if you were, was um, our contractor. Um, he had a, another project where he was uh, milling a roadway. And so he had extra material that he could use on our project. And because it was a night operation, that's when he was able to bring it to our site. And so um, he did that kind of without my knowledge, but uh, he did that, you know, and, and I applaud his um, effort on, you know, getting free material for us, but it did happen to be, I think at 10 o'clock at night. And uh, I believe it happened maybe two nights in a row or so. Um, and uh, I did, um, respond back to this, uh, to the person that brought up the complaint and he understood. And I just uh, conveyed to him that that was a one-time thing just for um, a night or two and that uh, it's not gonna happen again. And, you know, I talked to our contractor and he understands that he can't do that again either. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, that issue's, you know, kind of put to bed at this point. Very good. Well, well, thank you for taking care of it. I appreciate it. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Mr. Devin, do you need anything further from council tonight? 
No, I don't, uh, uh, City Council, Mayor and City Council, uh, other than um, behalf of our team, since I probably won't see all of you together again until next year, uh, wish you the best for the holiday season and Happy New Year and all that stuff. So thank you. Very good. And uh, Mr. Jones will be running the first meeting in January and he's going to do such a great job. You're going to hope that I don't come back. So uh, that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you all in the new year. Take good care. Bye now. Thanks. Bye-bye. We're adjourned.